Welcome to the course on the golden moments of addictions, alcoholism, and three principles webinar series. When Greg talked about his insight, this was so powerful for me. I mean, I it was such a fluke even that we got together. It was just a total fluke. And uh, and I phoned him up and he told me, he talked about his insight. None of the words, none of the words had any description to the insight that I had. Yet, I totally identified with my first insight on Salt Spring Island to what he was talking about. I could feel the spiritual juice that the the alive I, I could feel this no the comprehensiveness of it and immediately i felt like i found a, a, a friend it was almost like i knew him from the beginning of time and we had we had hardly met and it's continued to be like that because our insights or our soul connected together and allowed us to be privileged, I mean, it's just a privilege to be able to share. And I'm not even gonna say what we share, but to share truth. And so remember, it's a spiritual, psychological insight that will help clean you out in your bullshit. That is my definition of it. <laughs> orientation is coming from this self that's insecure and needs to be protected it's going to be hard you're going to have a hard day it's just a sh tiny shift tiny little shift of of orientation of where are you coming from and the the i the principles are such a beautiful point of entry into that exploration because it isn't about never having a feeling again that's completely not that's completely missing the mark it's a the freedom comes from having any experience having all of it and having knowing it, where it really comes from yes yes freedom is not never being afraid again because that's not possible freedom is being fully in life from the orientation of the true nature of who we really are, which is aware of awareness of all of it, awareness of the good and awareness of the bad. When it starts to get personal, then it gets hard. And we go in and out all day of the personal and impersonal, but we get beautiful feedback to letting us know where we're oriented. If it's about me, oh my God, look out. I got a lot of work to do and this is a big deal, but it feels that comes with a bad feeling. And so I'm like, oh, look, I know what's going on. So it's a gentle shift in orientation. Like in the school, in little school, a big change, there's new people coming in all the time and, and they're focused innocently on the behavior, on their habit. How, what do I eat? How do I stop smoking? How do I stop drinking? I drank this much. I ate this much. And I feel, and Amy and I just gently take them by the shoulder and look, let's look over here. And they go, Burr! and we go, let's look over here. Burr! It's so obvious, you know, it's so innocent to want to stare at what's in your face, which is the habit or the addiction, because it's the, the, the visible layer of the manifestation of your um, invisible thinking that, that hasn't bubbled up yet for you. But just gently reorienting back to what is before, what's upstream, what's way before all of that manifests into a behavior or anything like that. 
And it's such a relief. But in the beginning, it's very natural and normal to want to know how to fix this. How do I stop this habit or this addiction? But it's, it's the cart before the horse thing. It's after the fact. It's not where the juice is. So it's just a little reorientation. You know, you, you brought up a, a point, Amanda, that I think a lot of people are confused about when they're teaching the principles and, let's say, addiction or di eating disorders. The, you said, normally we talk about the, the way the mind works or something of that nature, and we stick to that because that's where the healing power is. In this case, you talked also about the specifics of the, of the, uh, the uncomfortableness the person was feeling when they were going to the gym or whatever it was. And, and that brings a really important point that you're, there isn't a rule that you should talk about this and not that. Yeah. Uh, and for me, there was always a separation between those two worlds and it created a hell of a lousy counselor. Yes. I, that's the only thing I can describe it as, you know, and when those two worlds became one, it didn't matter where we were because we were expressing it from the mind and the feeling of the client rather than uh, what I was where the healing lies type of thing. And right. could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, you know, I, when I think I know what they need to hear, I'm in trouble because I don't know. I'm walking with them down a path. We're having an exploration, a conversation. Every once in a while, I'm going to turn to them and, because I'll hear something that is curious and we'll have a conversation about it. But I don't know what they need to hear. I don't know. I'm, I'm just walking along with, alongside them. And so we didn't actually, we, there aren't, I used to think that I wasn't supposed to talk about the behavior at all. But I found, like you just said, that that was really limiting. That's cutting off one arm of experience and, why do that? So it's very, it's very fluid and free. It's more of an art to listen, ask questions, get curious. And because they know, I don't know anything more than they do. So it's pulling, it's, it's, it's pointing them to that fact that I don't, I'm not here to fix them. They're, Everything they have is in their awareness right now already. So we're just walking together and exploring. And there's a real freedom in that and less pressure to make something happen or make a solution appear. Or, and, you know, and so for her, she, we, we did talk about what are you getting out of this behavior a little bit. And then we talked about the, the, the habits are causing the anxiety she's trying to avoid. But that, you know, it came to her during the week. It, it, it showed up in the behavior. We didn't talk about, I didn't say, now, when you're walking to the refrigerator, I need you to remember these two things. It came, to her, it came through her because it had, she had an insight about it. And it just happened to have to have to do with the behavior. Does that make does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's leaving it really open and just curiosity all across the board.
so I work with people with eating disorders and I work with people with alcohol and drug disorders and I don't really deal with their disorders I just treat them like people and help them to see that it's just the state of mind they're in that's creating this craziness and when they start to see that you know that they're okay it gives them a sense of power and that's I think what counterbalance that out of control feeling that you know that you're the thinker right and you know that you're okay because everybody's okay in that in our natural state you know so being a therapist like to, to me you know I, I'm just kind of a uh, uh, see it as I say it as I see it kind of person and um, when I when I help people my job is just to be in the best state of mind that I can be so that I can really be connected to that person because to me there's a magic that happens in that moment is that the, the feeling in me draws out the feeling in them and then just helping them to see what that is because I was listening to one of your shows um, I'm not sure which one maybe um, and somebody was talking about how there's this kind of magical thing that happens in um, in recovery that a lot of people have had moments when they've had that kind of spiritual awakening but they didn't know what it was and so they went back to thinking, you know, and that's, that's a deal. It's like we all do that, right? We all get caught up in our thinking. And, and um, that's kind of the fun of it when you're out of it. <laughs> when you're in it, it's not so much fun. But it, it's, to me, it's like understanding that that feeling, like living in a beautiful feeling is the purpose of us helping people with the principles. That's the purpose. And, you know, that's really different. In, in psychology or in treatment, the goal is not happiness. Isn't that odd? It's like the goal is functioning, maintaining, coping with, but it's not really being who we are. prison and one of the guys for 26 years has been doing every course going everything and he was so intellectual and he was quoting everything at us and you know but he's on a treadmill that he'll never get to the end of this knowledge he's doing more and more and more but there is no end and a bit like me overworking there was no end to it and the guys are saying that you know in their because ours is a London prison so it's a lot more um, they're quite boisterous, um, gang members, really lovely characters, and um, <laughs> have, like, just like fun lives, like they've been like dodging things, and um, there's been a lot of effort. There's a lot of work involved in it, um, a lot of bravado, and they talk about you know this, you know, having this macho image, and even on the wings, they've got to look out. There's a lot of looking out for each other, and a lot of politic. The prison. The biggest thing for most of them is the is the politics, is the dynamics between all the men. And um, but before, you know, that can be quite exhausting. And the, and the making money, and then what do the trainers look like, and what socks have you got? So they talked the other day about going to Nottingham Carnival in the old days with diamond socks. And depending on whether you've got your socks turned whichever ways, whether you're East London, North London, South London, and all of this, and they're living their whole lives you know, with this, what they see now is just a complete made up, you know, it's completely made up, and they, but they were just in that. And then 
like this 10 week group, they sat there and they're just all just straight, honestly, straight away, just dropped. And even in the first morning they were popping. And I thought I could just finish now. We don't need to do 10 weeks. Um, so many of them had seen really big things, but they said the biggest thing is just that in that room, they can be themselves and they've not been themselves ever, like ever outside of prison, ever in prison. And loads of them are looking forward to going out to see like experiencing life. But what's so cool is they're saying, but I'm not eager to get out. I'm not like waiting around to get out. Life is now. So it doesn't matter that they're not out now, but they're looking forward to, to seeing how they can live life on the outs um, in a different way. And they talk about wanting to help people. And I can't wait to see, I call them like little dandelions that, you know, you blow it and they're all like cascades and go into life and live life. And some of them will share the principles, others won't. Um, but how they'll do it will be so creative. And it's lovely that they're in this little bubble that they don't have any exposure to the three principles community at all. Um, we share Sid books with them and um, Sid, Sid audios in the classes and things like that. Um, but we point them back to themselves all the time. Um, and even on my 10 week group, I've got, um, this peer mentor, the one whose daughter had died and, um, and another peer mentor and two guys who popped really early on and all of them were out doing one-to-ones on the wing, sharing their books. They've got, one of them said, I've got, um, I went to visit them and um, he said, oh, I've got a guy who knocks on my window who comes to talk about the principles through the window. Um, and eventually he pointed him out to me and I said, oh, that's so-and-so. He, he has done the, the um, Beyond Recovery before. He said, oh, I'm not sure. But <laughs> I said, because his, our, our man's been quite impacted. And I said, well, some people don't necessarily, you know, see, we all see different things in our, in our own way. But I just thought it was so cute. And I've got another, another man who's, there's, um, he's got a lifer on his wing who's been in for 12 years and feels that it's a miscarriage of justice. And um, he's been just talking to him and he said this lifer wrote a letter, I think for some parole or for some hearing or something. And in there he'd written this paragraph and he showed it to our man and he said, um, and it said that he'd never been listened to in his life. Um, and yet there's a guy on the wing who just listens to him and let, lets him be and just hears him. Um, and he said, that's you. <laughs> So, you know, I, and it's not about having to go out and share this, but they're so moved by what they've heard that they can't help themselves but go out and, and share it. Um, yeah, I just think that's lovely. And it's coming from them. And they each hear whatever they've heard and they share that. Um, and it's so pure, they just share whatever it is that they hear. Um, and so they might, might not have heard what I've heard, probably not. Well, insights are infinite, aren't they? So they will have heard it in their own way and then they all just go out and uh, live life. it is is it's relaxing in the moment of course easier said than done you know but it's it's fine and it's spiritual unfolding and with that well I'll finish with one little story I was sitting in the car with Sid Banks and I was going through a lot of beautiful feelings and I said she said, the spirit moves slow, doesn't it? And he said, with a big smile on his face, as only he could smile, and he said, yeah, real slow. That's the way it moves, real slow. 
and our mind goes real fast. Yeah, life moves real fast and the spirit moves really slow. <laughs> Go with the tempo of the spirit. You'll have no problem. You're a beautiful guy. We all know that, by the way. Yeah. You're a beautiful guy. <laughs>